you have your Bibles today, you can turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It's the only verse we'll be at today. As you're turning there, I want to thank you for your prayers while we were gone and uh, had a great revival and uh, enjoyed uh, being uh, home for three services there and, uh, well, four services. And uh, we were uh, privileged to see uh, some family and while we were there and so... I was really glad to be able to do a little bit of both while we were there. Of course, we came back and forth every day. But uh, uh, good to see my pastor uh, growing up. Uh, He was the only pastor I ever knew, Brother Harold Moore. And uh, he's been here a couple years ago. And uh, just an ironic thing, you've heard me, probably some of you don't know, uh, my pastor growing up was saved here at Belvoir in the old church, uh, Brother Harold Moore. And uh, he left and uh, became a pastor and pastored our church for about 20 some years and uh, he is now uh, on the other side of town at Cornerstone Fruit Baptist Church and uh, just the joy to see how God works and and, and just kind of turns it all the way around allows me to come here who uh, was saved by the ministry of the the man who was saved here and so what an amazing uh, thing that is and uh, how God works that but I am glad to be back in my home pulpit right here this is my home and it don't feel right unless I'm around this this place right here. So uh, I do want to say thank you for your prayers. Uh, Mrs. Estelle Steiner, you know, she passed away, and we do need to pray for uh, her and her family and the Taylor family, and our prayers has lost loved ones recently. But uh, she's still making me laugh. Uh, She always had a knack for these little things. I have in my possession that uh, the family gave to me that she wanted me to have a three-piece chicken dinner, and it's in a little box like this. And you open the box and it's three pieces of corn. And uh, today the family found another thing that she had and I just I thought it was funny. It's an exercise block. And you uh, place it on the floor, walk around it twice, sit down and relax. You have just walked twice around the block. <laughs> so I'm exercising now. All right. <laughs> They're still making me laugh. I, I always enjoyed uh, visiting with her and, and laughing. And you know, I... This has got nothing to do with the sermon, but I'm looking forward to heaven. Uh, A lot of folks who've gone on before us and a lot of folks, uh, even while I've been here in the three years, almost four years going on, uh, that I have been here, a lot of good folks uh, that I I, want to see. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing. And uh, that's wonderful hope that we have in heaven. And I want you to understand today, if you don't have that hope and you don't have that peace or assurance of salvation, you can know that before you leave today and you don't have to be hopeless. I want to share a message entitled God's Answer to This World. God's Answer to This World. In Romans 10, 13, very familiar passage of Scripture. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your words today, Lord, the words of assurance, the words of promise, the words of eternal life, the words of salvation, Lord, today that are ringing loud in this church for those who may not know you. There, Lord, I know a crowd this size. There's someone here that doesn't know you. And I pray today that, Lord, you would uh, speak to their heart. You would challenge their heart. And, Lord, I pray you'd challenge your children's heart. Lord, I know sometimes in messages like this we tend to cut off because we're already saved. But, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would allow everyone to understand today that there's something for some every person in this congregation to get out of your message today. Father, it's not my message. It's your message And Father, we we ask you to, uh, Lord, bless the service, bless the time we have together. Lord, I pray your spirit to fall. You would convict hearts, that you would save sinners. Lord, that you would transform homes and lives today. Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I remember as a child growing up, my mom and dad often told me about riding bikes not to sit on the handlebars when somebody else is riding a bike. How many of you parents out here have ever told your children not to sit on the handlebars while somebody else is riding the bike? Raise your hand. We've got a few parents out here that have had that done. I don't know if they even ride bicycles anymore. I don't know. But we rode a bike. I rode a bike everywhere. That was my method of transportation before I got my license. 
and I like to ride around the farm and, and things like that, but my dad would always, he'd catch us. We'd go outside or something, and my cousin's riding a bike, and I'm on the handlebars. My dad said, get off that, get off that, get off that. He'd warn me countless times, don't sit on the handlebars. I have a cousin by the name of Jamie. And he might be looking at this, we'll be looking at this probably through the internet. Sometimes he listens to some of the services. But Jamie was responsible for just about 90% of all broken bones that I had growing up. We were playing tag one day and he grabbed a hold of me and he, he spun me around several times. And his mom comes out and says, Jamie, let go of him. Guess what he did? He let go of me. I went flying into my grandma's house and broke my collarbone. Uh, Jamie was riding the bike this day. I was at my aunt's house, so I thought I might could get away with it. We were riding around out front yard right across from Jacksonville High School. And I was sitting on handlebars, and all of a sudden my ankle gets caught up into the gear work or whatever it was in the bike. I mean, tight. And Jamie is pedaling. He, he starts to realize there's some resistance. It's like, stop, Jamie! And I, I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I'm screaming, and I'm hollering bloody murder because it hurts. I was sharing this story to the high school Bible study. They wanted to see my scar. I actually have a scar on my foot from that time. And I was screaming. I was hollering. I, I needed help. And, you know, Jamie knew how to get me in these situations, but he never knew how to get me out of the situations. And so Jamie's sitting there. He's probably worried that his mom's going to tear his tail up. You know, he, he's trying to figure out what to do. There's no tools. There's no nothing to take apart the bike. I'm screaming. I'm hollering. My foot starts to change a little bit of a color. And, I mean, there's just a lot of screaming, a lot of hollering. And all of a sudden, some guy across the hall, across the street from Jacksonville High School, he worked in the maintenance department and public school systems. He, you see him like a bolt of lightning. He comes running over to where I was. He had heard me across the campus, me screaming. He was on the other side of the school building and heard me screaming and began to run towards the noise because he realized somebody was in trouble you see had I not called out for help I would have never received the help that I so desperately needed may I tell you this morning just like me a little boy trapped in a bicycle that, that is threatening with his foot to be amputated or, or maybe even I, I don't know what would have happened had I stayed there but our world is in the same not necessarily the same situation but has a problem nonetheless that needs to cry out for help we all have a problem this world has a tremendous problem it needs help this morning you and I need help this morning and the only way that you and I are going to receive help from God Almighty is that we call out to Him. The word call there has the idea of pleading for help or calling up for help. The idea when you pick up your phone and you dial 911 because something crazy is going on or some kind of emergency has come up. This is the idea here from the word call that suggests distress. It suggests a problem. It suggests a, a need. And surely that is the picture of our world today. It is in need. It is in distress. And I want to share with you God's answer. There's an answer to the distress. There's a solution to the problem that we see in our world today. There's a solution in your life. You've come in here and you've been sin-tattered. You, 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 your whole life, you're weighed down this morning. You've got all kinds of sin. And nobody knows what you did last night or the week before. And you've come into the sanctuary with that sin and with that lifestyle. And maybe it's weighed you down. And maybe you're just finally sick and tired of living that way. Well, God says this morning that you don't have to live that way anymore. You can call out. You can cry out to Him. You can dial up Heaven's hotline by calling Him out and He will answer your call. God's answer to the world. I want us to see, number one, that man does have a problem. Man has a problem. All men have a problem. Now, when you hear me say man, I'm talking about mankind. So we, we know that everybody's included here. All have a problem. Notice the call here, the plea here in Romans 10, 13 is whosoever. It, it, it's anybody who wants to call. Everybody has the problem and therefore everybody is able to call out to him. 
all have the problem. Just look through history. You can discover that there's definitely a problem with the heart of man. I thought about Hitler. You've heard me say this maybe a few times before. I had a college professor that told me in systematic theology. He said the only thing that separated him from Hitler was time and opportunity. And that kind of made me step back a few minutes because I'm, I'm like, well, man, Hitler was a terrible guy. How could you compare yourself? But what he was saying is that he was a man, he was born a sinner, and he was just as capable of doing what Hitler did. This morning you are just as capable of doing what Hitler did. Because we are all sinners. We see Hitler. I thought about 9-11. Think about those tragic that tragic day. Everybody remembers where you were when that happened. How could man, how could anybody come up with such a devious plot to destroy lives and people? It's the heart of man. I thought about this week on the news. You don't have to look too far on the news to discover that man has a problem today. I was looking this morning on Fox News and They were talking about a 14-year-old boy that tried to hold up a convenience store. He stuck a stick in his sleeve and poked the sleeve out to make it look like a gun. And one of the delivery men that was there found him, grabbed a hold of him, and body slammed him, and the cops came and got him. But I thought about that. 14 years old and holding up convenience stores. And look, that's just one story of thousands this week. I mean, look how horrible mankind has become. Look at, look at how horrible through the years, but also in current events, how horrible man is. So we understand this morning that we have a problem. Mankind has a problem. There's something desperately wrong with mankind. Think about all the adultery and all the lying and all the stealing, all those things that have taken place in our world today I was talking to somebody from Holly Hill and he was, they were telling me about how many times they had been broken into I think it, somebody told me our parsonage before we moved in got broken into I mean if I'm going to go rob a place it surely ain't going to be the house of God or anything connected to it but today there's no shame I thought about this, this shop down the road you know how many times they've attempted to get that poor man safe down there at the corner stop I mean, all the way to the point of knocking walls down and knocking the ceiling down. Man is desperately wicked. There is a problem. What is that problem? Well, it's easy. Sin is that problem. Sin is that problem. Sin, because of sin, because of our nature. I was reading a book One time it said that within us is an exact duplicate of Satan. You see, here's here's the thing. Here's where I'm getting at today. We live in a world that wants to tell you that man is essentially good. I mean, you go to see a psychologist, a worldly psychologist, and he's going to try to fix you from within. Well, the problem is you can't fix you from within. Why? Why? I'm about to share several verses with you to prove the point that man, there's something wrong with them and the solution is not found within. See, here's what the Bible says in Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us in here have sinned. Nobody's perfect. Raise your hand if you've sinned. Everyone has sinned. No one is excluded. All have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. They've missed the mark. You and I have missed the mark. It's obviously obvious today as we look at mankind and we look at the history of mankind, it's obvious that they have not hit the bullseye. That You and I have not hit the bullseye in life. No one is perfect. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, preacher, what is sin? The Bible tells us in 1 John that the sin is the transgression of the law. What is that? When you do something that is contrary to the word of God, that is sin. When you don't do something that the word of God tells you to do, that is sin. 
So all have sinned. All have been disobedient to the Word of God. All of us have. I think back to my bicycle incident. Had I listened to my dad, I'd have been okay. Had I listened to my mom and dad, I wouldn't have got myself in that predicament. That's our problem. Because we have failed to obey and adhere ourselves to the word of our Heavenly Father, we have sinned. We have missed the mark. The Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He catches it right at Adam all the way down. If you are here on this earth and you're walking on this planet, you are a sinner. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Wow. Let's go a little further. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities or sin, like the wind, have taken us away. Think about this for a minute. Your life without Christ... You say, preacher, I'm going to make it on my own. I don't need that gospel. I don't need that word. I don't need this message. I don't need this quote-unquote salvation. I'm going to make it on my own. I've had people tell me that. Witnessing to them. I'll be all right. What God says in Isaiah is simply this. On your best day, your righteousness, your goodness is nothing but filthy, nasty, stinking rags if I want to take it a step further that filthy rags has the idea of bloody nasty rags this morning nobody wants anything to do with a nasty bloody rag that stinks God says on your best day that's what you are that's what your goodness amounts to it's nasty so folks as we can see at our best we need help At our best, the world needs Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I think it's clear today that the solution for man cannot be found within man. You can't fix man's problem within man. You can't fix the world today. You can't fix your home today outside of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. So that brings us to number two. We understand that man has a problem, but we also understand that man is hopeless on his own. Man is hopeless on his own. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man is hopeless. The word call suggests the hopelessness that he can't handle it. Why are you dialing 911? Because you have a problem that you can't handle. It's an Ohio. A new individual that was suffering some pains in their chest. I'm not a doctor. I'm not somebody that can identify what it is. I can't fix the problem, so what am I going to do? I'm going to dial up 911 because they can get him the help that he desperately needs. And that is the same truth here today. You and I are hopeless on our own. There's nothing we can do except get outside help. There's nothing we can do except call upon him. Man can't save himself. The Bible tells us in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. You and I can't save ourselves. There's not enough good deeds on this planet that you can do to merit eternal salvation. You and I are eternally doomed without Christ. We can't save ourselves. I know some people that, that think they're trying. Preacher, I'm I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. I do this and this and this and this. You see, salvation is not found in works. It's not found in doing good things. You and I can't save ourselves. That's why we need to call out to Christ. 
Man must understand his own desperation. If we're going to fix our problem, we're going to fix our heart, we're going to fix this world today, we all must understand our own desperation. Our own desperation. Look at Romans 10, 9, just a few verses above it. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The word there, confess, means to agree with God. It means to agree with God. You have to come to a point in your life where you say, Yes, I'm a dirty, rotten, my, my righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm like that belly, nasty, stinky Rag, I understand, Father, that I'm nothing. I understand that I need help. I understand that I'm in a situation that only you can get me out of. I agree with you, Lord. I agree with what you did on the cross for me. I want you to understand this morning, again, man is hopeless on his own. But what had to happen is that Jesus had to come along and bring salvation by hanging on the cross that he hung on for six gruesome hours as he shed a precious blood for you and for me. And we've got to confess to God and say, God, I agree with what you did. I agree with my situation. I ask you to come into my heart and life. I ask you to save me now. And the Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. This morning, this is the only hope for our world. This is the only hope for your home. This is the only hope for your heart and my heart. We must understand and we must realize our own dirtiness. The law of God. A lot of people debate on the why did God give the law. Some people have this idea that God's law was given so that we could go to heaven. That's not true. God says, thou shalt not lie. God says, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery, shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not steal. We know all the Ten Commandments. God never gave them so you and I could do them and be saved. That's not the purpose of the law. The Bible tells us very clearly this morning that the law was given to show you and I just how dirty we are. You see, it was only by the law that I realized how wrong I was. You see, because I'm a liar. I'm an adulterer. I'm a blasphemer. I'm a thief. I'm serious this morning. I'm a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer, and I'm in this pulpit this morning. Now, if we were honest, I think we would all agree that we've come close to breaking, if not all of them, at least most of the Ten Commandments. Amen? The only thing the Ten Commandments do for you and I is show us how wicked and dirty we are. It's a mirror. It's God's mirror. You've heard me preach on the Ten Commandments and I brought the mirror in here uh, several months ago. That's God's law. It shows us how hopeless and helpless we are. and We need to confess our sin. We need to agree with God about the wretchedness and dirtiness of our sin and get right with Him today. Man is hopeless on his own. So we understand man has a problem. We understand that man is hopeless on his own. But then finally this morning we understand that man has an answer. Yes, it's grim up to this point. Yes, it seems as if we are eternally doomed. But may I tell you, Romans 10.13 tells us that there is a solution to this problem of sin. There's an answer for you and I. And His name is not found in a work. It's not found in doing great things. It's not found in accomplishments. It's not found in coming to church. It's not found in giving money in the offering plate. It is found solely the answer to your home, the answer to your problem this morning, the answer to your heavy load this morning is Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call out and to cry out to the Lord Jesus this morning is the answer to the brokenness of man, to the heart of man. Thou shalt be saved. The word saved there means rescued. Signifying again the trouble that man in our world is in today. It needs to be rescued. You walked in here this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. 
you need to be rescued. You understand you're a dirty, rotten sinner. You understand the sin that you did last night. And God knows all about it, by the way. Your community, your family, your world, your husband, your wife may not know exactly what you did, but God knows. And you need to be rescued. You need to be rescued from that heavy burden that's weighing you down. You'll walk out of the sanctuary today and not trust Christ and you'll continue to be weighed down. But God says today that I want to rescue you. I want to save you. I, I, I bled and I died. You see, Jesus died for you. He paid your price on the cross. He took your place and shed His blood for not His sin, your sin today and my sin today so that we can be rescued, so that we can walk away free. Jesus is the answer. God guarantees rescue to all. He says, thou shalt be saved. Some of you this morning, you may be here and you're doubting your salvation. I want to park here just a second. And I understand this morning the Bible tells us to be saved is to be a new creature. Old things are passed away. Yeah, we understand that. But I know several Christians who are defeated today because they doubt their salvation. This probably touches close to half of our congregation at least one point or another. And one day as I was going to school, I began to doubt my salvation. And I was reminded of this passage of Scripture, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I want to ask you a question. If you're in here today and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, did Jesus save you? Yes or no? He saved you? Did, did Jesus promise you that He would save you? Did Jesus say, Thou shalt be saved? Or thou, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Three verses from that. If God has promised you according, you are saved according to the word of who? God. I'm saved. How can I tell you I'm saved today? By the authority of the word of God. Not my situation, not my circumstance. You see, a lot of times we go through circumstances and we fail and we mess up and we make mistakes. And we think God doesn't want nothing to do with us. And we think maybe we have forfeited our salvation or whatever we want to do or say. May I share with you today that Jesus, if He has promised you eternal life and you have received that eternal life, thou shalt be saved. It's a promise of God. Man has an answer today and it's Jesus. You see, this morning, I was telling you that story because this passage reminds me so much of what happened that day my foot was caught in the brake or whatever it was caught in I don't know I, I can still remember the pain and the agony of being trapped in that bike now that has nothing to do with the pain that you will receive when you burn in hell forever and ever without Christ but I was in pain I was in agony I, I, I needed help. I was screaming and I was hollering. And all of a sudden, this individual heard my cry and he zipped over to where I was and he took the, the tools that were necessary to get that bike loose and he freed my foot today. And, and we asked him, how in the world? He says, I could hear you screaming all the way on the other side of Jacksonville High School and I just knew that somebody was in trouble and I knew that I had to get to that person and help them. May I tell you today, God is listening for your cry. And just like that man zipped over quicker than that man zipped over, God will zip over. And God will free you. You know what the Bible says? He that is free is free indeed. You can be free from your sin, free from your burden, free from your labor, free from your toil this morning. You can take your weight and you can cast it to this altar and give it to God and He'll come and He'll rescue you today. 
I wonder today how many of you are here and you've been doubting your salvation. Maybe you need to come back to this altar and say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Because on the authority of your word, I'm saved today. But maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. You've been playing church. Or maybe you've not been playing church. Maybe you've just walked in. And, and, and you know, you know that your life is not right with God. The message is not a bad one today. The message is a good one. It's a plea this morning. Because the Lord wishes that none should perish. But that all should have repentance. He desires you to be in heaven, not hell today. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Hell is not worth it. Will you get up today from your pew and make your way to an old-fashioned altar and give your life to Him? Call out to Him. Dial His number here at this altar with every head bowed and every eye closed.